someone who clearly has an opinion that is not going to be changed. If you or your pet is bitten by a tick, it's a guarantee that they'll get Lyme disease. And that is very far from the truth. That tells you it's in our environment. It's in the fat of the chicken. You're eating it. This is what we are doing to our environment and to our children and to ourselves. I'm sorry, that turned into a soapbox, didn't it? Talking about um, the dangers of some of the, <laughs> all of the <laughs> neurotoxins that are used for um, flea and tick prevention and treatment. And I am going to talk about some of that today. There's some scary stuff out there. And unfortunately, um, traditional veterinarians, uh, people who represent big pharma, and the pharmaceutical companies that make the chemicals, uh, they accuse us of fear-mongering. Well, I hope I am. I, I hope I am putting fear into people who are using these chemicals, because if you love your pets as much as I love mine, you will not use them when you hear the statistics that I am going to give you today. This series applies to both dogs and cats. Um, some diseases we see more in dogs than we do in cats. Um, so sometimes the, or at least we haven't been diagnosing them in cats. Some of the tick-borne diseases we really don't diagnose in cats. I don't know if it's just because we haven't looked or if they are really resistant. I think a lot of it is that we haven't looked because I think that people who have kitty cats who go outside may not take those cats to the veterinarian as much. Um, maybe if they're having short-term symptoms of a tick-borne disease. Um, for instance, we don't really ever test or treat cats for Lyme disease. But what if they do get it? What if our outdoor kitties are getting Lyme disease because they have ticks on them, but we don't notice the symptoms? We don't see what's going on. It's not something that we have a routine test for. So how do we know? How do we know? Anyway, so here's some of the fear-mongering that goes on from the other side of the fence. So uh, this is from something that I wrote a couple of years ago, but every once in a while, this Palisan virus spread by ticks will show up on social media feeds as, oh my gosh, we all have to take chemicals and treat ourselves and stay out of the woods. And, you know, ticks are horrible and ticks are no fun. I hate them. But according to the CDC, 75 cases of Palisan virus disease have been reported in the United States over a 10 year period. That's seven cases a year. It has, uh, there's no evidence that the virus affects dogs or cats, but Every time this recycles on social media, people go nuts and say, oh my gosh, I have to put chemicals on my dog or cat or give them chemicals because I don't want them bringing a tick in because I don't want to get this horrible, deadly disease that affects seven people a year. So talk about trying to instill fear where, I mean, I have more likelihood of getting injured or maimed walking across the parking lot especially at some of the parking lots I've been in lately. The virus uh, mostly occurs in the Northeast and Great Lakes region, fever, headache, vomiting, weakness, confusion, seizures, and memory loss. Um, so it's not even that those 75 people have died from it. It's just that it made them pretty sick. Hmm, that's what viruses do. They make us pretty sick. Amazing. So let's switch over and talk about Lyme disease. If we look at social media, if we listen to the fear that is instilled. And I was doing an interview with somebody, Rachel Fusaro, and there was a woman on there because we were talking about fleas and ticks and chemicals. And there was somebody on there who was just blasting me about Lyme disease and how dare I, it's a serious disease. And, you know, everybody needs to treat their animals with chemicals. And I kind of, I didn't even get involved in the conversation because it was someone who clearly has an opinion that is not going to be changed. And I will warn you when you get into these arguments with people online, you're not going to change their mind. So just 
agree to disagree rather than sinking to the name calling. But social media would like us to think that Lyme disease is something that is carried by every tick. And if you or your pet is bitten by a tick, it's a guarantee that they'll get Lyme disease. And that is very far from the truth. This is one of those things that makes me a little bit nuts. My sister actually said to me the other day, because her puppy has uh, an autoimmune encephalitis, and she gave him way more vaccines than I ever would have given one of my dogs and or any of my dogs. And she said, well, Lyme disease is a life or death situation in New England. He had to have the Lyme vaccine. It's a crappy vaccine, guys. It's 60 to 80 percent effective. And by the way, has a lot of side effects. And now her poor puppy has autoimmune encephalitis. Did the Lyme vaccine cause it? I have no idea. Did the three distemper vaccines cause it? I have no idea. Was it just a weird fluke? Maybe. But in 1989, my Doberman developed granulomatous meningoencephalitis. It's an autoimmune disease of the brain and spinal cord. It made him go blind overnight. I took him to the neurologist. We managed to get his sight back and we managed to treat him with high doses of steroids and immunosuppressants. But that neurologist in 1989 said to me, this was caused by the distemper vaccine that your dog was given a few months ago. If we knew that in 1989, why do we not know that in 2023? Why, is, why are we suddenly saying these things don't go together? Here's the thing with Lyme disease. New York State, uh, a bunch of scientists did a study, tested ticks to see what bacterium and organisms they were carrying. 20% were carrying the Lyme disease. So if you find five ticks on your dog, one of them may be carrying the disease. Now, you may have a really bad day and all five may be carrying the disease, but only 20% of the, the ticks carry Lyme. If your whole focus is, I have to prevent Lyme disease, I have to prevent Lyme disease, I have to vaccinate with a crappy vaccine that is not very effective, I have to put chemicals on my dog, let me just tell you that dogs that are taking oral flea and tick chemicals or are having topical flea and tick chemicals put on them are not protected from tick-borne diseases. We used to think that it took 48 hours of the tick being attached in order for the organisms to be transmitted and for the disease to be transmitted. That's not true anymore. We now know within a few hours, and maybe even a lot less than that, the organisms are starting to be transmitted. Certainly the longer it stays attached, the more organisms can be transferred to the animal. But here's the thing. If you have a healthy animal with a robust immune system, they are not going to develop disease. They may be infected with the organism, but that doesn't mean that they are going to have symptoms and be ill from the disease. Testing for tick-borne diseases. I used the 40X or the Acuplex in my practice, and I think most practices do now. So when you get a heartworm test, it also includes testing for anaplasma or lichia and Lyme. If that test comes back positive, it's a screening test. That does not mean that your dog has anaplasma or lichia or Lyme disease. Does not mean infection. It means we've detected that the animal has been exposed to that organism you have to do a follow-up test. Now, if your animal is limping, it's sick, it's got flu-like symptoms, it's painful, it's got a fever, it's got a low red cell count, it's got low platelets, that's a sick animal. Okay, a positive test with a sick animal, I'd probably treat that one. However, if you have a healthy animal that's in for a routine checkup and you get a positive on the screening test, you absolutely need to follow up. So for Lyme, you do a quant C6. And for the other tests, you're going to do something called a PCR. And if your veterinarian doesn't know about those tests, please educate them and say, well, yeah, you just did a screening test. It came up positive, but my dog's acting perfectly fine. I'm not going to treat my dog with antibiotics that are going to wreck his microbiome unless I know that we have an issue. So ask for the follow-up test. Ask for the PCR. Ask for the C6 if it's a Lyme positive. If that comes up positive, yes, then we have organisms that are infecting the body and going to cause damage. But if we have a negative PCR and a negative C6, it means yeah, we got bitten by a tick that was carrying that organism. The body got exposed to it and the immune system said, oh my gosh, attack, attack. And it did. And it made antibodies and it protected the animal. Isn't that a beautiful thing? The immune system did what it was supposed to do. 
that's what we're looking for. So we need to stop panicking about a tick bite. We need to look at the area for a reaction. Is there a red ring around it? And a red ring, we, lo we look at that, particularly we've been trained to look for that red ring for Lyme disease in people. But ticks actually inject an anticoagulant when they latch on. So it makes it easier for the blood to flow and the saliva to flow into the blood. So a lot of times we'll see that red ring from any kind of insect bite, but particularly from tick bites. But you do want to watch them and keep the area clean. If you leave the head in the the animal and you only get the body, it's going to die. It's going to fall out because the head can't live without the body. So don't go crazy about that. We do have on the website, these little tick puller kits. And so there's a little forceps that is double ended. There's a really pointy one. And then there's this little fork thing that you can get under the tick with. And you're more likely to get the whole tick if you use these. I would say cover the tick with a little bit of witch hazel because that doesn't sting or a little bit of Vaseline or something just to kind of make the tick a little bit angry, maybe get it to release a little bit and then go after it with um, the tick removers. Do not light a match to get things off of your, do not, I, I hope nobody does that anymore, but I know when I first started in practice, people would do that all the time. And it's just a bad idea. It's just a, don't, please don't set your animals on fire. In our ebook, we have an ebook that you can download on um, fleas, ticks, and heartworms. And in there, we go into much more depth on each of those diseases, the Ehrlichia, the Anaplasma, um, Babesia, a lot of the tick-borne problems that we do see and talking about how to prevent them and natural alternatives for treatment as well. I want to talk about chemicals a little bit. Oh, and there is a place if you pull a tick that is embedded on your dog off or your cat or you, and you are concerned and you want to have it checked to see if it is carrying any disease, you can send them. The website is tickcheck.com. You can send the tick in so go to their website, you can send your tick in and they will test it for a bunch of different things. And they'll let you know whether that tick had anything. And then that gives you a better idea of whether you need to consider treatment, testing, any of that kind of thing. Um, most of these diseases, they aren't going to show up for a few weeks as far as symptoms. So you get the tick bite and then you'll see the symptoms in a few weeks. So that's when you want to be watching. Like don't pull a tick off today, run to your veterinary office tomorrow and say, I need a test because it's not going to be positive. You're not going to get a positive test immediately. Um, so it's going to take a little while. Let's talk about the um, veterinary and pharmaceutical industry a little bit. This was from a course that I took a couple of years ago. So this information, this is probably four or five years old. So we'll just have to up the numbers a lot. They were talking about a discussion of flea and tick-borne diseases transmissible to pets and humans. They also talked about the financial impact on veterinary practices that weren't encouraging all pet owners to use year-round heartworm flea and tick prevention. They analyzed 2.3 million transactions for 263,000 dogs over a 12-month period across 99 practices. The results showed heartworm preventive compliance was 25%. Flea and tick preventive compliances was 16%. The financial impact to each practice was huge, with an annual opportunity cost per practice of $400,000. So what are your veterinarians being taught? You're losing money by not having everybody in compliance. And those are old numbers. So that number is probably much higher now. But what they did not look at in that study, they didn't look at practice location. There are some areas of this country where ticks are not a problem. So they didn't look at that. They didn't look at individual pet exposure to fleas, ticks, and heartworms. It's very different in different parts of the country and different lifestyles. If you have a dog who lives in a high rise in New York City and doesn't go outside, how many ticks are they getting? Should that dog be on flea, tick, and heartworm preventative? I don't think so. They didn't look at the travel that the pets might undergo for significant portions of the year. For instance, people who go to the South for the winter and the North for the summer, it's going to be very different. And they didn't look at the individual needs for prevention. The pharmaceutical companies work diligently to convince the veterinary community that all pets should receive monthly preventative chemicals with no regard to exposure potential. Even veterinary experts like Dr. Susan Little, a veterinary parasitologist at Oklahoma State University, make blanket statements. Dr. Little and other parasite experts have a mantra, every pet, every month, all year long. And when we're going to talk about some of the other stats with these chemicals that are being used, that is very scary. Of course, the, uh, that veterinarian's laboratory has received uh, research support from 
big pharma. Shocking. Okay. So my, my thing on that is we shouldn't leave decisions regarding our individual pet's health up to big pharma. Each pet is an individual, should be treated as such. There's no one size fits all. Following a mantra of every pet every month all year long may result in the needless poisoning of millions of pets. Don't be bullied. Choose the right plan for your pets. Uh, mine are treated without the use of harmful chemicals every month all year long. And I treat when appropriate and recommend it for my recommended in the past for my patients um, when appropriate. So I want to talk about um, some alternative things that we can use for tick treatment and prevention. And then I'm going to talk about some statistics and studies that are really scary. So I know we're talking about ticks today, but you know what? The flea comb is an amazing thing because people talk at the teeth are very, very close together. And we usually talk about using it for getting fleas and flea dirt and flea eggs out of the coat. But it's really good at pulling ticks out too. And when it snags on something, you go, oh, what's there? Man, it might be a lump, a bump, a papilloma, a wart, or maybe it's a tick that has been embedded and the teeth are very close together. So people say, well, I can't even find those little tiny seed ticks. That'll find it. So particularly if you have a short-coated dog, you know, pointers, dogs that are going out in the fields, in the woods, doing uh, one of my friends in New Jersey, she's been doing a lot of field work, a lot of field trials with her pointers. So she uses natural repellents, but a flea comb when she came in from the field would be wonderful to run through those dogs just in case she missed something. So the daily tick check is your most important defense. Um, so if you do go out, uh, you can use something very simple like the sticky uh, tape rollers. Run that across your dog. If there's any ticks on the surface it's that haven't attached yet, it'll pull them off. It's an amazing thing. Like I said, we have the tick pullers. So when you're doing your check, use your tick pullers to pull off anybody who's there. I'm a huge fan of Buck Mountain Parasite Dust. It's diatomaceous earth, neem, and yarrow. So it's, you don't need a lot of powder, but you can put that, brush that through your animals if you're going out into a tick area. Project Suds, Janine Ling, one of my favorite people, has these wonderful products. So we've got the Flea and Tick Shampoo. These are essential oil and apple cider vinegar, all natural. Love these. This is what I use for my pets. So we have a liquid shampoo. We have the bar soap, which I'm a huge fan of the bar soaps. And then we have the Flea and Tick Spray Concentrate. And then it comes with a spray bottle or you can use your own spray bottle and dilute it according to the directions on there. Um, so those are very effective to use uh, if you go out in a high tick area for the day. When you come back, if you have a dog with a thicker coat that you cannot get a flea comb through or you can't get through every inch of that dog, then either spray them, give them a bath, do something or, you know, put some powder on them just in case they brought somebody in that you didn't catch. From Animalio, have Evict and Away essential oil. So these, you don't need much of this at all because they're little tiny bottles. We do have the bigger bottle if you have a lot of animals or horses that you're using more. The Bug Off is back in stock, and this is a feed-through powder with neem, nettle, apple cider vinegar, wheatgrass powder, holy basil leaf, uh, black pepper, cayenne, sage. So that is a feed-through. And then we also, it is the Wolf Creek Flea and Tick feed-through powder. You can also feed garlic. Um, it works for ticks as well as fleas. Um, coconut oil is also helpful. And then for more information, we have our ebook. And also there's a whole chapter on this in the new Raising Naturally Healthy Pets book. So let's talk about these drugs a little bit. So we do have a detox protocol available if you have given your dog uh, neurotoxins, whether that be topical, oral, you, you really should detox your dog, even if they've never had any kind of reaction. Uh, these The isox azolines bind to fats and the brain is 25% fat. So we have to displace the chemicals from the fat cells in the body. One of the ways you can do that is by giving MCT oil. So that's my favorite fat to use. And that's the one that works the best. We want to avoid using, well, certainly the isox azolines. That's Nexgard, Brevecto, Semperica, Semperica Trio, Cordelio. As of April 17th, 2021. So this information is two years old. 17,468 deaths had been documented. Uh, Brevecto was 4,753 of them. Remember, this is two years ago, so we've had a lot more sold since then. NextGuard had 6,000 deaths uh, that 
have been documented. Semperica Trio has 6,700 deaths documented. So we know that we've had this many deaths documented as of two years ago. And when they say documented deaths, that means they admitted that that's the death that it's been caused by the oxazoline. So there is a lot more deaths that are reported, but the drug companies and the veterinarians go, eh, we don't think it's related. It didn't happen the same day. And there have been for those same drugs, over 420,000 adverse event reports as of two years ago. And we know that only 1% of adverse events get reported. That is really scary. If we take those 17,000 deaths and we multiply that by 100, that's two more zeros, folks. That's a lot of dead animals. I don't want mine to be one of those. So let's get into some statistics here. So this is an environmental study. Um, and interestingly, they took hair from a bird nest and they were testing for four things. Fipronil, Florilaner, which is um, Brevecto, uh, Imidocloprid. Do we have that? It's in Advantage Multi. Um, it's in a couple of other things. And they were testing for Fipronil, which is in Frontline and a couple of other things. But in the hair, in the bird nest, it contained all of those chemicals. And this is out of um, Denmark, I believe. Oh, they were testing NexGuard, Brevecto, the chemicals from those drugs. And they had a, the nests they were taking them out of, the juvenile birds all died. So the question is, did we have the death of these birds because of the chemicals that is in the dog hair that is being used to build the nests? So here's what I can say to you. If you are using any kind of chemicals on your dog, do not put the hair outside from the hairbrush. If you shave them, you know, if you mop your house, do not put the hair outside for the birds if there's chemicals on it because we're killing our environment. We're killing the birds. Now, when I shave my horses or I uh, groom my horses, they don't have any chemicals on them. That goes out for the birds. I don't use any chemicals on my dogs. I don't put my dog hair outside, but I could. Um, so keep that in mind. Yeah, this is a Dutch study. Um, and then they also found secondary transfer from uh, dogs who were treated to their environment and to each other. Dogs were found to be, and what they were doing was hair samples and urine samples. Dogs were found to be contaminated with one or more chemicals that they were not directly treated with and not living in a household with animals who were treated. So this is just contact going to the dog park, you know, being around other dogs playing, going to daycare. Imidocloprid was found in 100% of the hair samples, and these were sent in by owners. Uh, but eight out of the nine dogs had not been treated with it. So 100% had imidocloprid in their hair, but 89% of them had never been exposed that the owners knew of. Fipronil was found in 100% of the dog hairs, and next guard, a foxalaner, in almost all urine samples, but none of the dogs had been treated with those ingredients. Why do they have these chemicals in their system if they've never been treated with them? That tells you it's in our environment. <laughs> Here's another interesting one with fipronil. Fipronil is uh, in frontline and it's contaminating Europe horribly. All the waterways are contaminated. 98% of samples of the hair of French children contained fipronil. Children, this is what we are exposing our family to. Imidocloprid was also detected in human urine in Wuhan, China. So all four analyzed chemicals were detected in hair and or urine of dogs untreated with those active ingredients. Currently, imidocloprid and fipronil are banned from outdoor agricultural use by the European Commission, but they are approved for flea and tick control treatment, and a foxalaner and floralaner are designed specifically and approved for flea and tick control treatment with limited other uses. This is all they're used for because they're very toxic to the environment, and they're in the environment. So secondary transfer by direct dog-to-dog -dog contact may be a major pathway, and via urine and feces as well. 
So your dog may be getting exposed when you're going to the park or you're going to the dog park or you're sending them to daycare. And pets of other species kept in the same home can also be a source. So examples of these were the two homes in which cats were treated with imidocloprid while the dogs were treated with serolaner, but the dogs still had detectable imidocloprid re residue in their hair and urine. I doubt they're licking the cats, but who knows? And then in the Netherlands, in both natural and agricultural areas, fipronil, fluorolaner, and imidocloprid were found in dead juvenile birds. In the Netherlands, Floralaner, which is Brevecto, is permitted for use in flea and tick control products for dogs and cats. And it's also used in the poultry industry to kill poultry mites. It's called Exult. You may be eating poultry that had been treated externally or internally with Exult. I think maybe it's a feed through. It's stored in fat. It's in the fat of the chicken. You're eating it. It's in the skin. That's high fat. You're eating it. This is what we are doing to our environment and to our children and to ourselves. Floralaner has not been analyzed during any sampling campaigns in surface water. Uh, so they haven't analyzed the rivers in Europe or anywhere else for Floralaner. Imidocloprid was detected in 19% of surface water samples in, this is in the Netherlands, and in 90% of in and effluent samples from wastewater treatment plants with all values above annual average environmental quality standards. We're bathing in it. We're drinking it. We think that we are living this safe life. And then we wonder why we have such high rates of cancer in people and in animals. Why do we have immune system problems? Why do we have dysbiosis? Because these things screw up the gut as well. So uh, alfoxalaner has not been measured in water either. And then one of the really cool things that they did is they put um, three dogs in a little swimming pool. One dog had been given oral brevecto and the other dogs hadn't been treated with anything. And after the three dogs swam in the water together for just a couple of minutes, all urine and hair samples from the dogs and when the water was tested, all contained fluorolaner, imidocloprid, and fipronil. So the dog who was given oral brevecto is secreting enough of it through its skin and hair that just swimming and being in contact was enough for the other dogs to now have detectable residue. Very scary. Ponds at popular sites visited by many swimming dogs are a high risk. Common areas such as parks and recreation spaces have a high degree of connectivity. And in their study, all the dogs that participated had frequent contact with other dogs during their outdoor walks. A boarding kennel, there was a, one dog that was not treated at all by the owners, but it showed high levels of fipronil and imidacloprid, uh, suggesting that boarding kennels are potential hotspots for secondary transfer, may apply to training classes, dog walking services, other places where dogs are kept, kept together. So we need more research on this, absolutely. And human behavior in product choice and use is extremely important. Because remember, when you put it on your dog or give it to your dog, you're affecting everybody else. I don't know, maybe you don't care, but I do. Okay, so their research demonstrated that dogs can transfer anti-flea and tick pesticides into the environment, posing a potential risk to both terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. Um, it's not in this study, it was in a different one. They tested children's clothing after, uh, you know, animals in the house, uh, dogs and cats had been treated with uh, topical and oral products. And they tested the children's clothing and found the chemicals, particularly like in their t-shirts where they're hugging the animals, petting the animals. They did studies of petting. They used gloves and petted the animals and tested the levels that were found in the, the cloth gloves after petting. Obviously, the levels were much higher in the first few days after a product is applied, but they were still coming off 30 days later. So if you're using these, you're sleeping with them, it's on your sheets. You're hugging them, it's on your clothes. You're petting them, it's on your hands. You're absorbing it through your skin. You know, think about your own safety as well. Uh, Gene Dodds did an updated summary on the use and safety of flea and tick preventatives, um, particularly looking at, she looked at the Seresto collar and then went back again and looked at the Isoxazolines. And basically the results say, updated results from the USA and European Union indicate a noteworthy increase in the number of reported adverse events from the flea and tick preventatives and collars beyond what was originally on the product labels, including seizures, behavioral aggression, and death, 
The actual number of adverse incidents is likely much higher than reported. We know that. The veterinary profession has been less than forthcoming in informing their clients about these potential serious side effects. So am I fear mongering? I don't know. Do I want to scare you away from using these things? Yes. Oh, here we go. The official data of all parasiticides used in the U.S. retrieved from the FDA through April 17th, 2021 included 16 brand name drugs, a total of 1,577,958 adverse reactions with 60,909 deaths as of two years ago. And we think that only 1% are reported. I'd be scared to use it. That's all I'm going to say. So ticks, we got tons more information in the ebook. We got tons of products that work. And for those who say that they don't work, I will tell you, if you are in a very high tick area, somebody uh, said they were in Rhode Island and they came in from a walk and found 14 ticks crawling on their dog. Well, that's great. You found 14 ticks crawling. They weren't attached. So use whatever you're going to use, but chemicals do not repel. So if you use an oral or topical chemical neurotoxin and you go out for a walk in a high tick area, you're going to come home with ticks. They don't repel. You have more likelihood of an essential oil being a repellent. Essential oil. I got a bunch of them here. Much more likely. So spray your dogs, wash your dogs, powder your dogs, comb your dogs, go over your dogs, use tick pullers, use sticky tape, whatever. Try to avoid the high tick areas. And do we want to have our dogs not be able to go run and play? So Karen Becker said when she lived in Chicago, lived in a very, very high tick area, and she wanted her dogs to be able to run through the woods and play and do normal dog stuff. She used natural products on her dogs, and then she tested them with the 40X twice a year to see if they'd had any exposure. And certainly if they were acting sick, you would get them in quickly. But she just tested twice a year. And twice out of her five dogs, one dog one time, one dog another time, had a positive Lyme test. She said, oh, okay, I'll do a C6, the quantitative test. They're both negative, no treatment needed. It's all about using common sense, not being panicked, not being backed into a corner, not being bullied to use a neurotoxin and play Russian roulette with your pet's health. For all the traditional veterinarians who want to say, I've used it. And by the way, for traditional veterinarians who say, I've prescribed these products hundreds of times and I've never seen a problem or a reaction, it's because you're not looking and it's because you're not connecting the dots. When you have an animal who suddenly bleeds out internally, because these drugs, the isoxazolines, were originally looked at to be anticoagulants, huh? they stop clotting. So when we have animals who suddenly hemorrhage, but they were given the drug three weeks ago, and you go, no, can't be related. Do your homework. There's a huge correlation. They are neurotoxins. If an animal starts having seizures, I don't care if it's after the first dose, the fifth dose, the tenth dose, stop using the chemicals. Stop using them. You're sentencing them to a lifetime of despair. And for those who come on and say, there's no, no way that this occurs, I want you to say that to the hundreds of people who come on the feed and say, my dog died after that. My dog's had seizures since being given that. My dog developed whatever. Tens of thousands of animals have been killed. And if you have no sense of empathy for the people who have lost their animals to these chemicals, that is tragic. That is really tragic. I'm sorry, that turned into a soapbox, didn't it? Oopsie, I haven't had a soapbox for a while. <laughs>